Previously on Quest Friends. What do you know about the Fallen Ruins racetrack? Ooh, <laughs> Fallen Ruins Road, you say? Oh, it's haunted. By what? Well, what couldn't it be haunted by? Fallen Ruins Road is named that because it fell on this land 40 years ago. It carries both the regrets of those who fell in it and the regrets of the speedy speed boys it fell on. Wait a minute. Could these ruins be the location we're hunting for? There's a weird familiarity to hearing the bog again. Of course, Coachman's Tree, where the Speedy Speedboy hideout is, was part of the bog that is the eastern edge of the Ba'adenu forest, but with so many loud, rowdy boys running around and messing with cars that happen to burst through walls and go on escape chases, it just the smaller sounds start to disappear. But here, about maybe half a mile out, you can finally hear those smaller sounds again. You know, the little bloop, bloop, bloop of animals moving through the bog and the bubbles that arise. The small fluttering of wings of dragon fleece, which are dragonflies, but they have like... Little fleece jackets. What? <laughs> little, little fleece zip-ups is what I saw, like the kind you get for like high school sports teams. They're really cheap, but really good. Yeah, they're little dragonflies in jackets. Like a little club. <laughs> and this loud moaning from the settling ruins of Fallen Ruins Road, which has for the past 40 years been settling into the bog. Shock and Hop, you make your way towards one part of this ruin, a tall ceramic diamond that has some of that colorful mesh wiring of the Speedy Speedboy Coachman's Tree running around it. It's kind of like a half pipe that goes around that like a car could drive through. Now that aspect is purely Speedy Speedboy. After all, these ruins did fall on what used to be a part of Coachman's Tree 40 years ago. But the part that looks familiar to you is that tall ceramic diamond, which Cubo points out. This location seems to bear the same architectural style as the Obsidian Bay location that you encountered about a month ago. Yeah, you don't say. Hop's looking around. I assume that he's holding Cubo. Yeah, Hop, you take a few steps closer as you try to take in this large diamond tower more, and you lift up Cubo, who's glowing not only of his own robotic aura, but with two never-ending lit candles on his sides. Oh. You want to go to Fallen Ruins Road? Yes, that's the, that's the plan anyway. We have some things we'd like to um investigate there. Hmm... I suppose it would be a good idea to look at the racetrack. It hasn't actually been used in a while. And more than that, if there's any chance we can learn something about the truth of what happened here 40 years ago, that might go even further towards, I don't know, changing people's minds. And at least it lets us take out two blood barms with one screw. Hmm, I'm doubtful of that part. Uh, why? Why do you say you're doubtful? And she turns to, like, add something, and she just murmurs under her breath, upset Jimmy. Everyone just kind of listens to Jimmy nowadays, and Jimmy doesn't listen to anybody. I don't necessarily think finding evidence there would convince him of anything. I'm not really sure that's what he wants. I think I should have a talk with Jimmy. <laughs> From behind Ellie, Ness leans out and does the... <laughs> <laughs> one fist into his other little hand oh, no. with his claw hands <laughs> he does it really and is. you hear some buzzing behind Ayn as this giant robot cicada with a bedazzled trilby flies in and ZK says ooh a frightening and terrifying idea I think that is fantastic which is exactly why we will not be doing that 
and CK just kind of like flutters down and he does the bug thing where they like do their hands conspiratorially and he just like <laughs> slithers back. <laughs> It's it's not like I'm going to, you know, beat him up or anything unless he makes the first move. It's more just a civil chat between two people who have very strong opinions. That's what they're calling it nowadays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Ellie will look back over at CK. We'll discuss this later. CK, so two of his hands, now the rest of his little bug hands continue to do like the the conspiratorial thing. Well, I think, I mean, I think we should still try to get some evidence because evidence is everything. But, um, you know, there's actually a second reason that we want to go to the ruins. We're looking for something called Red's Blessing. Does that ring a bell? Red's Blessing. I'm not familiar with the term. Does it have something to do with the ruins? We think so. Hmm. There is one part of Fallen Ruins Road that no one's been able to really see a whole lot of. I suppose that might have what you're looking for, and guess we can try whatever we can to convince Jimmy. That sounds like as promising a place to check as any. Thank you. I is it okay if we go look at it? She crosses her arms. I suppose if there aren't any official restrictions, they're going to keep a closer eye on the drifter for the race, but for Misha's pit crew, I don't see any reason why not. Great. So, um, Hop will turn to the rest of the group and be like, uh, I think we should get going right away to look at it. Who wants to come with? Because I, I kind of really want to go look at it. Shock is going to, like, pause and look over at Misha for a moment and say, I don't want to leave you alone here, but I guess I'm the only one who can read the writing, so I better go. I'll watch Misha's back. Jock will nod. Oh, uh, thank you, both of you. You don't need to worry about me, Shock. I think it makes more sense if you go. And you also shouldn't worry about me, L.E.B. I can be fine by myself also, though I appreciate that you will take care of me. I know you can take care of yourself, but... We all kind of take care of each other, too. If, if you want to go with them, you could, too. Don't feel like you have to stay because of me. No, but uh, if you needed a light that you could be sure wouldn't go out, and Ellie's going to take off her hat and pull out a candle and hand it to Hop, and then pull out a second candle and hand it to Shock. You, you wave your hand, and it lights up, and then wave it again, and it goes out. Thank you, Ellie. We'll take good care of it. Take good care of yourself. And so moving back to the present day, those two candles have just been dock taped onto Kubo's side. But really well. Really well, really gently. He volunteered to serve as a kind of reading light. You know, like the old fashioned lamps that get held by the top and then they're just dangling the gas ones. They creak when you hold them up. Yeah. He agreed to do that, not only because it was just an easy way to hold the candles, but it also got him as close as he could get to the actual things you were trying to look at, which, you know, it's, it's a win win for everybody. And so you are standing again outside of this large uh, diamond. I was originally going to say it was like a rhombus, but if you just take a rhombus and make it 3D, that's just a diamond. So it's a diamond. True. Well, isn't a rhombus just specifically that all the sides are the same length? Yeah, which means it's either a square or it's a diamond. Yeah, I said it's true. I agreed with you. I know. I'm 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 correcting Tom right now. <laughs> oh, correcting is a very strong word. <laughs> I meant more like I'm debating with Tom right now. Debating is also a strong word. I look confused because I'm trying to visualize it. It looks like the Sims diamond on top of a sim. <laughs> I know what a diamond looks like. Honestly, when you first said diamond, I imagined a baseball diamond. <laughs> so it's good that we... Uh, like, then you said tower, and I was like, oh, it's like a solid building, not a diamond shape on the sand. No, it is It is a solid building. It's got ceramic on the outside, ceramic tiling. It looks like the tiling that you found on Obsidian Bay. This one is an actual diamond diamond. But it is not made out of diamond, correct? It is made of ceramic. I have already seen Said this. Okay, well, you also said actual diamond diamond, and I didn't know how to take that. There is a diamond, 
There are spiraling columns. We don't have to keep dwelling on the diamond. You just described what it looks into like. Into this large door. And we don't have to do this. Through which you can enter to the inside of the diamond. I enjoy having things over explained to Tom. So you can keep doing it. Fuck you too. So as you walk into the diamond, which is made out of ceramic, but because the bottom half got consumed by the bog, your diamond actually looks more like a pyramid. That's I was gonna say. To say yeah. that. I'm so fucking mad? This entire time, we would have been like, oh, look, it's a pyramid. Let's go in. You were describing to <laughs> us a pyramid, which you described first as a rhombus, then as a diamond, then as a diamond diamond. Why wasn't this one of the pictures that you drew? <laughs> you drew all these pictures and got rid of them because you were like, fuck dungeons. It needs to be <laughs> described in audio format so it can be easily... I know, but... You are in a pyramid, but in actuality, it's a diamond. Half of it is underwater. <laughs> Under the bog? Under bog. There we go. So as you walk in, it looks like the floor is made out of bog because the bog is like pressing up against the flexiglass. So the flexiglass is like the floor? Yeah. So flexiglass is this invisible barrier. It lets through gases, but when anything harder tries to go through, it actually presses against it and grows white as kind of the molecules go to catch that thing. Okay. okay. So I think Hop will like hover Cubo over the flexiglass floor where the bog is pressing up. And he's trying to look for any kind of like any kind of indication that there's still stuff there. He doesn't know the properties of this bog. It could be scary properties. This bog seems to have very good preservative qualities. Typically, it takes about 10,000 years to induce fossilization. But in being in close proximity to the bog, I believe that things could be fossilized within only a few decades worth of time. Wow. That was from Hop. He's very into this. He's very enraptured by Cubo's information. Going into the bog, therefore, things must be also very well preserved. However, without the correct form of protection, the fossilization process may in fact take only a few minutes. Oh, well that that's faster than ideal. How did we get here through a bog that instantly turns you to stone? And the Easy Life brand can't save you where you're going, kid, because you don't die, you just get preserved. <laughs> That's really scary. That, I don't like that. I'm going to shove that aside. <laughs> I'm going to shove that thought out of my head. Shock wants to look around this entrance and see if there is any writing. Okay, that's a good catch. So you are looking for the writing, which as we remember, and by we, I mean me and probably nobody else. As was mentioned last arc, the writing it was words written on these glittering powder pages. You don't see those pages anywhere in here, but you do see that glittering powder, which seems to be floating around in places, kind of like hovering in front of certain doors and hovering all around you. And give me a roll. I, I want to see how much you see, how much knowledge you get right away. All right, I will spend two levels of effort. That costs me nothing. I got a seven. You got a seven. With two levels of effort. Yeah. You see two things, and specifically you see two doors. One door seems to be linked to some sort of like what looks to be maybe an elevator shaft, but it's blocked off. And in the powder next to the door, it has labeled blue module, other modules connected to, and then it's blank. So it seems like because it's not connected to any other modules, this door to the elevator is broken. But then on the other side, you don't see writing, but you do see another door that's pretty much right next to it that seems to be a place you could go. Shock will communicate these findings to Hopper and then just say, it looks like we really only have one direction for the moment. Yeah, I guess so. You don't think that we... We didn't really bring any protective gear. No, no. But you're good at traveling through hazardous environments, right? Hopper shrugs. I've picked up a thing or two. In the worst case scenario, I can... And then he stops himself as he remembers that cannot at will use his magic. I can ask if we can use my powers to build something. Hop will raise an eyebrow at that. I'm sure they could be convinced if you're in a dangerous situation, don't you think? Uh, probably. It worked with the Iron Wind. 
Well, you know, uh, you know, for instance, my dad's always had this rule that if I was out late and maybe in a situation I wasn't supposed to be in, you know, I could always call for help and I wouldn't get in trouble right then if I was trying to help somebody else or, you know, if I just really needed help at that moment, we'd talk about it later. I mean, you know, they would ground me later or whatever, but I knew that they'd at least help me out in the moment. So I'm sure, you know, they'd help if we really needed it. You know, if you really needed it. Shock looked down, not really meeting Hopper's gaze. Probably. All right, Hop, you ready to declare some fossils guilty? Fucking yes. So you make your way up to the next door, which is actually up a a small staircase. And as you get closer, you actually do see writing. And the writing says something along the lines of the blue module, focusing on research of alternate observation and turnabout thinking. Yes. (laughs) Give it to me. (laughs) Which we would think of as puzzles. And if this whole place was open air, everything would have just been slooped up by this point, right? It all would have been turned into basically air fossils. But in this case, a space has actually been preserved on the inside, a series of rooms which you can take from here to the top of the tower. And this has actually been preserved because a series of vines has been growing all across this. It's it's part of the bog for the most part. There are these bog like vines that aren't actually really affected by the fossilization because this is where they exist. And they're roping around and they've been really taking over the space. You've seen it a little bit, but this is the most notable because they've actually knotted themselves completely over the door, locking in all air in there. Long story short is they're not actually fossils, but there is like this just door of vines covering the archway. I'm sorry. I just imagined like vines like I want to see my little boy. <laughs> like all these videos all over the door. Like we can't get in there. Too many vines all playing at once. Should have left you on that street corner where I found you. <laughs> but, but you, you didn't. didn't. And the reason the vines can't fossilize is because vine is already dead. <laughs> <laughs> that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> But I still appreciate it. (laughs) But that being said, you do actually hear some things that aren't just comedic vines coming from these vines. Things like, my wife? Or, I got me a drink. Or just, I did. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to listen a little bit closer to see if they say anything helpful in any way, shape, or form. Nothing that can help you get through the vines themselves. Although, Hop, you could swear as you get up to them, you do hear this one whisper. Sleep more. Sleep more. Sleep more. He ignores that one completely. (laughs) We all do. Um, would you call these vines an environmental hazard? I guess. Yeah, you (laughs) can Yeah, they are. The answer is yes, because they're clearly an environmental hazard. I would like to apply my skill in navigating those things. Um, you going to wriggle through the vines? I was hoping I'd come up with an idea while I was speaking, and I haven't. So I'm just going <laughs> to keep talking while I'm thinking out loud. What happens if I touch them? They don't really move. They they will like shrink back a bit, but as soon as you move, they'll go back to their former place. But I'm not hurt. They didn't hurt me. No. And in fact, as you pull your hand back and you're like, what is happening? You actually hear them also whisper, critical questions remaining. (laughs) Like what? (laughs) He responds to the vine. Critical questions remain. Critical questions remain. Do you think horses freak centaurs out? No. They don't respond to that. Okay. (laughs) just hoping that maybe they would. I am not certain that these vines are able to consciously respond to a sopper scotch. Yeah, my bed is on no, but just wanted to try it out. Mm. Got any ideas? Uh, only bad ones. I could try to cutting light through the vines. Hopper's hesitant. I don't want to, like, hurt anything here. That's a good point. What if we cutting light the wall next to the door and make a new door? That's a really good idea. Let's do that. Uh, I will have to ask then. One sec, and Chalk will sit down, close his eyes, and reach out. You go and you reach out, and then suddenly in the distance you hear this 
and the vines recoil in fear as you too, Shock, are just like jumped out by this very aggressive, violent sound echoing through. Did Hopper hear anything? Did did Hopper react as I did? I would have jumped. Okay, he jumped. So yeah, everyone heard that sound and the vines retreated. This this monstrous sound. Almost like that one that you had been warned about. It sounds like that sound came from above. That is very fortunate since that's where we're going. And so we can isolate both the source of the sound and continue on our adventure. Yes. Relevant question. The vines jumped back at the noise, right? Yeah. So Hopper is not actually immediately concerned with the monster because he thinks it might be like a myth. So he will turn to Cuba and say, hey, Cuba, do you think you could imitate the sound that thing just made? Like at the vines? Ooh. It looked like they were afraid of the loud noise. So if we make a loud enough noise, maybe they'll move and we can get past them. Hmm. That is a good idea. Let me try. <coughs> the vines don't move. <coughs> The vines still don't move. Wait, wait, let me try one more time. Turning off sound dampeners. <laughs> and hop and shock. Actually, roll me intellect defense. <laughs> Easy money, two levels of effort. I'm pretty sure I'm trained in this. I got a four, but with two levels of effort. I am also gonna use two levels of effort. Two. Yay, I'm back to rolling this way. Isn't that fun? Wasting all my pools trying to succeed. <laughs> so the sound is loud and definitely painful, but because Cubo isn't that high of level, it's not actually loud or painful enough to injure or like mechanically disorient you. It's just like, ow. Oh. <sighs> but the vines definitely do retract at that. Yes. We get through. Yep. Yep. Bolt on through. And Cubo so goes, I apologize Welcome to the announcement break for Quest Friends, episode 63, One Neon Night, part 5. I am Kyle, your GM, and in addition to our intro and outro song being Friends and Hitoshio, both by Miracle of Sound, my voice is very sore from a very fun bonus session that we recorded today. So I'll try to keep things brief. For our announcements today, I wanted to thank everyone who provided prompts for our vines. So a, a good while ago, I asked the good folks of the internet to just fill out a few prompts, things like what was the last text, what was the last line of a book you read, so on and so forth. And it was from that list that I pulled the lines for this episode. And I'm actually going to pull the lines from future episodes as well, because there's more to the vines than meets the eye. We do have a long-standing Q&A thing going on with our Tumblr. So if there's any question you've had with Quest Friends, anything you want to know, behind the scenes stuff, stuff about like fun character interactions, or just you want to express an opinion but phrase it like a question, check out questfriendspodcast.tumblr.com. And if you don't have a Tumblr, I would still start thinking of some questions because we may need some of those in a short while. But we'll talk about that on next episode's announcement break. For now, all you need to know is that our next episode will come out on Monday, September 7th. But if you'd like additional content before then, you can find stories, artwork, and behind-the-scenes insights at patreon.com slash questfriends. I'll see you there.
All right, so you make your way into this first room and how this episode is going to go, I say like halfway through it, is we're going to kind of alternate between puzzle and lore. So as I mentioned earlier, you're not taking the elevator. The elevator seems to have to connect to other modules, whatever that is, to work. Instead, you're going up the old fashioned way. You're going into a room which is connected to a staircase, which is connected to another room, which is connected to a staircase, and you'll slowly make your way up this tower. Exercise. Yeah. So you're in your first room. Now this room seems to be a study of, I'm gonna say duplicate things is almost what it looks like. You see two of every object. You see two fossilized minionines, minions. You see two like flower pots or jars. You see two light bulb like shapes, a few dozen of just multiple different animals that you're not familiar with at all. And you see two of what are called sediment tattoo guns. These are the guns that make markings on the Prilemans. So, you know, Shock saw one with like prismatic markings that actually came from these little gun things. But notably, you see two mirrors. These mirrors have a green light around them. This bright green light that you've only seen when Obsidian Bay powered up as you tried to leave it, and you see it inside the Apocrita itself. There's like this frozen green lightning inside the cloud of the Apocrita. And the same color of light is surrounding two mirrors. And as you get closer to them, you see yourself. You see shock in one and hop in the other. And these figures just repeat at you. Stop. 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 Okay. That's the puzzle. So there's no other ways in or out of this room? You see a door on the opposite end, but it seems to be shut. I would like to go examine the pots. Okay. Why are you examining the pots? Because pots is stop backwards. And why are you thinking of stop backwards? It was the only thing that came to mind. I think Kyle's fishing for it because it's a mirror. Yeah, that. (laughs) So you walk over to the pots and you see that the two are right next to each other. And what do you do with them? I examine, I look for like a a key. We would like to click the examine option. Yeah. Okay. So you go to examine. You're like, I'm going to figure this out. You can't really see anything. You can see that there's a small like, I'm going to say divot that is running from the mirrors to the pots and then past the pots and to the door. And you can't figure out what the fuck that means. And you lift up Cubo a little higher to kind of get an idea. And you accidentally knock the pots over. And as you do, you realize they were actually blocking part of the divot. And what happens is the green light leaves the mirrors, continues past the pots, up across the wall, and then goes into and around the door. And as this light surrounds the door, it opens up. Yay! I got the puzzle right. I just didn't know why it was right. (laughs) I'm so impressed because that was so good. But I like that the only part that you didn't connect was the reason the word is backwards is because it's from the mirror. I'm just good at words. So I was like, letters, they're the same ones. And as you look around, you get a little bit of lore, too. This part is relatively basic. It's something you've seen before. It's those sediment tattoo guns. As you take a look at them, you can see that everything is labeled in this room. The pots are just labeled pots. You also see the sediment tattoo guns. They are used to basically denote a position. Every citizen of the Kingdom of Prilema has a job, and the roles they fill are relatively simplistic, they're straightforward, like the messenger's relay message, for example, or the puzzlers will focus on one specific puzzle. Huh, cool. Hopper writes it all down in his notes. Well, you write a telephone style version of it because Shock is reading it to you. Oh, that's right. I can't read it. Yeah, Shock translates and then Hopper writes down. Yeah, he'll... (laughs) I'm going to put them in my actual Google Doc. All right. So you get through this room, you go up through another staircase, and you are now in another room. Now, this one has a puzzle that I took directly from Professor Layton, and I think it's Arzan Legacy. It's A-R-Z-A-N. I think it's A-Z-R-A-N. Azrin. Google it. You're right. It's the Azrin Legacy. So this is taken from Professor Layton in the Azrin Legacy. It's the second puzzle. 
So you find yourself in a homey space. The first one was a very scientific space. This one seems to be like a rest area, like, you know, a communal relaxing area. You see like some notes that Pride Lehmans were writing to loved ones. You see just a small smoldering fireplace. And next to one of the relaxing areas, you see a gift that has a label on it. And this label says, Greetings, Tobias. Congratulations on the continuation of years past your birth. This is a gift I've gotten for you. The issue, however, is that working in the blue module for some reason or another seems to come along the lines of puzzles. And so everything has to be a puzzle, even if it doesn't need to be. And so what you see here is you see the present inside of a giant, about two kilogram thing of ice. And next to it, you see a jug of a special kind of water. And the letter says, 20 milliliters of this water can melt 15 grams of the ice. How much of the water do you have to pour? If you pour the correct amount, you'll get your wonderful gift. So it's a two kilo kilogram thing of ice. You have a thing of the special kind of water. 20 milliliters of the water will melt 15 grams of the ice. Shock upon reading this is going to be like, Upper Scotch, do we know what liters are and grams? <laughs> I'm not sure I have a frame of reference for the units of measurement Pry Lehman's used. Yeah, they're, um, Hopper has a skill in history, so I'm going to say he just knows math measurement history because that feels like a thing he would know. Yeah, uh, they're like old measurements. So one kilogram equals 1,000 grams. That's according to Google from me. And, uh, 20 milliliters is, uh... Can I tell how much water is actually in the thing? You have about a quarter of a liter in there. Quarter of a liter. But I, f I feel like no matter how much of the ice we melt, some of it's going to get on the present because it's in the middle of the ice. Yeah, but we, we need to do it only in small portions. If we can measure how far from the one end of the ice to the point where the present starts, we can calculate to just melt off some of it. We, if we do that from the bottom, then we can find the point to which we need to melt the ice from the top, right? Because we only need to melt down to the ice below the present. Or we could like pour it onto the floor and then stick the block into it and let it just slowly melt down. So if we take half, 1000 by 20, it'd be... Calculations finished. Would you like to know how much water you need to pour? Yes, please, Cubo. Is it none? Because we can just wait for the ice to melt. How many liters did you say was in the glass, Hopper Scotch? Uh, about a quarter of a liter. Oh no, I must have done my calculations incorrectly. According to my calculations, we would need more than a quarter of a liter of water to melt all of this ice. But we don't need to melt all of it, we just need to melt some of it to get the present out. Hmm, I suppose that is technically true, although it does violate the purity of the puzzle. Hopper Scotch, did you mention waiting for the ice to melt on its own? Ah, uh, well, I thought that might be a possibility. This area is rather cool and damp. If it would have melted, it would have done so over the past few decades. However, if we could find a warmer external source, perhaps it would be possible to melt the ice without using any of the water at all. You want to know the solution to this puzzle? Is the solution to take it to a fire and let it melt? <laughs> it's put it next to the fireplace. This is the genuine solution to the puzzle in the game. Is there is a fireplace in the background of the picture and you have to put it there. <laughs> so, I just realized now that this puzzle would have had no bearing on the room being open because the room should already be open because this was just a gift. Each of you roll me a d10 and I'm just gonna give you a cipher. Five. Two. Alright, so Shock, you get a pocket mirror containing a light that keeps bouncing between each half. As it does, the half of the mirror that the light is currently in grows unbearably hot. However, if you close it, it is not hot. And then Hallie, you get a box that holds a diorama of whatever room the user is in. Ooh. An alteration to the diorama will perform the same alteration to the room itself. I 
like that. And then finally, you get, I don't know, like oil that makes the candles grow brighter. So now you can see things in the room I didn't show you earlier. Anyways, you're able to rest in this room. You're able to see a few more things. Shock, as you look on the back wall, you can see that these letters are all placed into basically piles, each of them relating to a color that is spelled differently than how we say it. Like red is R-E-D-D, blue is B-L-E-U. You've got Grun, which is G-R-U umlaut from German N. And each of these seem to be piles relating to this map. And on this map, you see a bunch of different modules. It's a list of all the modules of Prilema. And under it is the text, each part simple in its own, but combined with others creates infinite complexity. It seems that the setup of Prilema is that each module serves its own specific purpose. Blue is for puzzles, green is a kind of residential district, uh, so it seems like each module has its own purpose and floats on its own, and they're just able to connect to each other, like, I don't know, toys that you buy and you get them out of an incomplete set and then you put them together and it makes like a bigger... Voltron! Yeah, it's a city Voltron, it's Voltron the city. <laughs> and so that must have been what the elevator meant, it must have not been connected to any of the other modules. You also see that each of the modules has like a definitive shape. So in the center of each, it has a shape. You have, for example, uh, this one has that diamond shape. Grun has a circular shape. Everything is focused around the circle. Orange has a octagonal shape. And you can recognize looking at that, that that is actually the exact layout that you recognize from Obsidian Bay. Ooh, cool. I take notes on whatever Jacques told me. Uh, so this is out of character, but there, there were humans in Prilema, right? No. This wasn't a human civilization? Because I've been laboring under that impression the whole game. No, they are robots with vine innards. That's all you've ever seen when you've seen Prilema. They're just robot people. Oh. Or stone people. Well, I now my Stellaris empire is inaccurate. <laughs> Fuck. All right, so you make your way through the remaining puzzles. For the sake of time, I think I'm not going to go through any other puzzles. There was an additional sound one I was going to do. In case anyone is curious, I'll throw that one on the Patreon mm. if folks want to try to figure out the answer to that one. Sure. And so then you finally make your way up to the top. You are now at the tippity top of this pyramid, which is actually a diamond, <laughs> but for all intents and purposes, it is a pyramid. You have gone through another layer of vines, and it seems like all the rooms you've been in have been protected by these vines. Hubo has scared them off for the most part, although occasionally you still hear that in the distance. And you finally make your way up to the top, and this top area looks vaguely familiar. Back when you were in Obsidian Bay, the citizens, or more accurately, the robotic duplicates thereof, had taken residence in two trapezoidal buildings each of which was connected to a long tube extending into the mountainside. And sure enough, up here you see the same. Multiple shack-sized, three-dimensional trapezoids with tubes extending out of them into the walls of the diamond and, presumably, beyond. And as you take stock of your surroundings, you suddenly remember that back when you explored Obsidian Bay, you found that these buildings had been housing small pods on their second floors. And you wonder, what connection do those pods have to the tubes? Oh, should, should I take the lead on this one? No, I thought it was directed at shock. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I was waiting for Hopper to do something. <laughs> In character, we both sit there awkwardly waiting for the other to investigate first. <laughs> it's, that feels like a very hop and shock thing to do, though. And Cubo pipes up. <laughs> I believe this room is meant to be a way to connect and transport to other modules. While we are not connected to other modules, it is possible that others exist through this bog, and these tubes might be the most effective way of getting to them. Oh. Kibu, do you think these tubes are still serviceable? We could be fossilized if we go through there unprepared. That's a good point. Hop looks almost disappointed because he was really excited at the prospect of, of tubing to a different <laughs> pyramid. Well, let's take a look. So you go into one of these areas. Now we're gonna flash back to Obsidian Bay. If you remembered when you went into the saloon, there was like this main floor and then you went up some stairs and there was this pod connected to a tube. 
And at the time, you didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Now looking at it, you see that pod again. This pod is something that you could fit into. Both of you could fit into a single pod. And while Obsidian Bay claimed these were like sleeping quarters, you realize now that with these stone seats, it's like the tubes from Futurama if you sat inside of things and it shot you through them. I gotcha. So you see this tube and uh, yeah, roll me something to try to get it to operate. Okay. 14. 14. You take a look and it doesn't budge. Damn it. Every time you've gone through a room, you've seen those lines of green light wrap around whatever something is. And it almost seems like they're powering you. Like that is what powers the area. And you don't see those around here. So it seems like this doesn't have power. Meanwhile, Shock, you've explored a bit further down the tube. There's still space where you can just walk through the tube past the little sphere thing. And as you get to the end, you realize that the end of this thing is kind of actually shattered off. Presumably what happened is while it crashed, you know, these tubes are very fragile. So presumably it just like snapped in two or something like that. As you look out, you can't see a whole lot because of the bog. It's completely pitch black in there. There's still the canopy that hides everything. You still do see in the distance some lights. Specifically, you see those tubes of neon lighting that were indicative of the walls of Coachman's Tree. And based on your excellent sense of direction, which Shot now has... I do have a good sense of direction, so thank you very much. <laughs> you can tell that these lights are not, in fact, from where you came from. They're from a part of the Speedy Speed Boy hideout that had been crushed when the Apocrypha fell 40 years ago. Hmm. And that's like, that's like far away, those lights, right? Uh, yeah, I would say it's about a long distance, mm. if I were to categorize it in one of the categories. Mm. Just one of the categories. Oh, hold on. Let me check something. All right, yeah, that's what I thought. That is within far step range. Shock will return to the, the chamber and say, well, unfortunately, it looks like the tube broke when this fell. So even if we do power it again, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to use it to cross. But... If I can use it, we could far step across. There's another habitable section on the other side. Do you want to try? I mean, I don't have any better ideas, so I guess I should. And once again, Shock will sit down, close his eyes, and attempt to reach out. Hey, Shock! How's it going? Hi, I, um, I'm just checking in. I needed to ask if I can have use of my powers. I need to far step across a gap. Oh. Dangerous gap across a bog. No other way to cross it other than far step. Oh, yeah. Dangerous bog. Nice and still kind of danger. Predictable. Far, far away from that speedy speed boy nonsense. In a manner of speaking, we are here looking for Red's blessing to defeat the Apocrita. Oh, that's nice. And also the ruins of Dr. Collodi's lab. Shock, could you repeat that last part for us? Dr. Collodi's lab? That's so strange. It sounds like it's familiar to you. Oh, yeah, Shock. And, and from that tone of voice, it sounds like it's familiar to you as well. Well, yes, actually. We're looking for evidence. The speedy speed boys think that Misha did something that they did not. And we're trying to see if we can uncover the truth of the matter. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, Shock. Remember back in the wheel, you weren't so quick to make uh, rash judgments. Back in the wheel, there was nothing to judge rashly. Very little change. You know, we just don't think it's necessarily a good idea for you to be jumping into all these hoops in danger to look up something that has already been sold. Unfortunately, we don't know the truth yet. And the fact remains that we are stuck here well, in this we're pretty, room. We recall telling you the truth, Shock. We recall... I recall you telling me very now, little. Now, don't speak over us, Shock. We recall telling you multiple times that the lady with cinnabar lips is dangerous and murderous and should be avoided. And we don't understand why you need more information than that. Because I'm planning on stopping her. We're going to help Misha. What? Now, Shock, that's a perplexing sentence. How are you going to stop somebody by helping them out? Because Misha Jarvis is their own person. Why won't you use their name? 
you know what? No, no, this is a waste of time. Back of the Wheel, I read a number of stories about wizards. Not all of them, but some of them end with a type of wizard who breaks their staff and burns their books. I guess that's my story, too. Is that, Shock, is that honestly what you think? Have we failed you that poorly to, to, to get these twisted ideas all caught up in there? You have some reflecting to do, I'm sure. But in the meantime, I'll make my own way. Our contract is terminated. Farewell. No, Shock, you can't do something so rash as that. We've been walking down protecting you the whole time. We promised, Horace, and you promised when you left as well, that you would make sure that we stayed safe. What are you gonna... And you sit in a weird kind of silence that has been unfamiliar to Shock before. Not a silence of the surroundings around him, but a silence of something in the air. Chuck will come out of his meditation and just sort of still sitting on the floor and just put his face in his hands and breathe deeply. <sighs> Didn't go so well, huh? Uh, so bad news. I decided to cut ties with the nano spirits for now. I don't know if I'm going to be speaking to them again ever, and I don't have any of my magic. Are you okay with how that went? Uh, ask me again in a few hours. I don't know how useful I'll be for the rest of this journey, but at least I can read the stuff in here. I suppose that's one thing. Well, we'll figure something out. You know, you, your magic doesn't define you. You're, you're plenty without it. You know, you don't, you don't need to measure yourself by that, is, is what I'm saying. Thank you, Popper Scotch. Although my arms are very noodly, and he does like the arm waving. <laughs> Popper will laugh a little bit and say, "We'll manage just fine." And as you say that, no, the echo resounds again, <laughs> but it gets louder <laughs> and louder. <laughs> and I need you to roll speed defense. something that hasn't been explored an awful lot. There's this uh, thing. It looks like a pyramid from a distance. I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> During the episode, we get into a big argument of whether or not it looks like a pyramid. Well, because you because described it as a diamond, like the one that hovers yeah. over the Sims, and then said, oh, it's half submerged in water. Oh, all right. So it looks like a pyramid. We were like, those are different shapes, Kyle Decker. Those are different shapes. I'm actually going to change what she says. There is one part of Fallen Ruins Road that no one's been able to really see a whole lot of. We had to build the track around it. It's got this angular shape. <laughs> it's pointy. <laughs> That's just what we're gonna call it. Because we can't agree on the shape. I have to I have to pretend that I haven't tried to describe it yet. That's true. Because to the listener, I haven't failed to describe it as a pyramid yet. Okay, that's a good point. There's a shape down in Fallen Ruin Ru Ruins Road that they say no one has been able to describe appropriately. <laughs> Each traveler sees something different when they gaze upon its uh, visage. <laughs> no, it's just it's it is a diamond, like uh, above the city. Sims head, but half submerged. Wait, it's <laughs> right. <laughs> A diamond that's half submerged. You're in our position now. Right? Like, that makes sense, but... In this pyramid diamond rhombus. I'm just, I'm just mad is all. <laughs> this pyramidus. Like, every Professor Layton puzzle where they ask you how, how much do you need for something, your second answer, if you were wrong the first time, should be none. Because it's probably like, you did it! You're right! You don't actually need to do this at all in order to solve the puzzle. It's like the time I legitimately wrote out formulas I remembered from like high school algebra class to do that freaking triangle puzzle and it was like if you flip it on its side you could fit the triangle in the other triangle and I was like fuck you <laughs> <laughs>
because I spent such a long time on it. That puzzle got everyone, every single one of us. Set me very much. You see the Menines are actually a copyright avoiding evolutionary deviation from the Anines. <laughs> They're tiny Anines that are so small they can float in the air high, high above where Monty Cook Games can sue us. <laughs> This is this is the new idea for the monster, <laughs> like just a vine beast. Like somehow we get attacked by both the guy who's sliding through that that wet gas station area and slowly sliding down the shades and the guy sliding down the snowy hill in a bathrobe with a cup of tea. Road work ahead. Yeah, I sure hope it does. <laughs> Everything is in crumbles and ruins. <laughs> <laughs>